that aggressiveness needs to be brought out at times in sport that doesn't necessarily have to be done in the in the men's game. So here comes homeschooling. Back to you guys. <laughs> mm. Richard Bergeson. Yeah, I have a question for well for Saul and for Matt and Kim and Sam. Anybody who's worked with female athletes, because in my role now with the Whippy Girls Association, um, is there a tendency among male coaches of female team athletes to be more tentative? I get the impression. Now, this is my first year having really watched carefully, I've watched dozens of practices this year, you know, with COVID, I get the sense that the coaches of young female hockey players, who, the coaches who are males, because they're all males, are somewhat tentative, that they're dealing with uh, raw eggs and they don't want to crack the shell. Am I am I wrong or am I just a raw green rookie after 40 plus years of coaching guys at a very high level? And now I'm seeing the way male coaches are dealing with girls. And and many of them have actually told me, well, I don't want to push the kid too much, you know, whether they're 11 years old or 14 years old. Well, I'm not talking about pushing. I'm, I'm talking about drawing out. What are you doing to draw it? Anyway, I'll, I'll, all right, but let's hear the answers. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if I have a lot of answers, but I, I would, I, I would like you to clarify what, what do you mean by tentativeness that you're seeing? Like, how does that manifest? How would I see I, that in a rink? I, I'm drawing on the word that that Saul had used earlier about. Uh, Coaches being, uh, uh, players being afraid, athletes being afraid to make mistakes, you know, uh, love versus fear, et cetera. In the male world, junior hockey, triple A hockey, where, where I've been, that's not a hard thing to instill in them because it seems to be ingrained uh, in the male athlete, male hockey player DNA to go get them, even at the house league level. Tentative means. I, uh, I'm afraid, not me, but the coaches. So I'm using the, the impersonal I with, with anyway, uh, that the, the coaches seem to be almost afraid to create environments and practice where the girls are being, um, asked to do more at a faster pace. It doesn't have to be a full speed pace. We are talking about children after all, grade four, grade six, grade eight, you know, even grade 10. They just seem a little bit tentative. And I'm trying to be really careful not to inject my approach that I've used for years on the boys side, on the girls side. But I have found that the coaches who are listening to some of the direction I'm trying to give are absorbing it. And they're starting to question now, maybe I've been a little bit soft. Well, I'll, I'll speak to my experience, um, mostly with younger players. But I, I do think you're, you're right in that. I, I don't know if it's coming from the coaches, but I see a physical tentativeness in women's hockey. Um, there, there are not that many players who will go into the scrum and come out with the puck. And uh, I was actually chatting with Al Ramsey about this last week and how, how we teach that. And I think in the female game, because we don't have full body checking often, and I'm generalizing the male coaches at younger ages will not teach checking or contact with the girls because they go, well, we don't have body checking. So it becomes low on the skill priority. Uh, so your ability to pr protect pucks using your body and that sort of thing. So it doesn't then, it isn't taught as a fundamental skill, like we would teach skating or shooting. And then, you know, trying to introduce it later or yelling at them for not doing it, they're sort of saying, why? You, you didn't teach me how, right? So I constantly watch peewee games, bantam games, whatever they're supposed to be called now, I guess U11, U15, where it's just everybody's on the outside. 
right? And nobody wants to get into the thick of things. But if I watch younger, uh, the coaches of younger players coach, they are not teaching that, um, I wouldn't say even aggressiveness, just that ability to use your body properly to protect pucks. So I think- I, I would use the word that, assertiveness as opposed so, to aggressiveness. Good word. So if you're teaching assertiveness and that physicality, I like the word physicality, right? It, it doesn't mean you're punching someone to get the puck, but like you're using your physical strength and speed um, and, and doing that in competitive drills and understanding in a one-on-one situation how to battle for that puck not just to send them in the corner and battling, but actually teaching them how to build the wall with their body and, and, and all of that goes with it. I, I just think it's a, as a, as a coach, as a bench coach and a skills instructor, it is not taught at all in the girls' side. Uh, and I think that's a humongous mistake. Um, and I think it's it you see it at the older age groups and, and a lot more injuries as a result because of that lack of physicality. Okay. I, I agree with you, and I know you're all over that, Kim, because that seemed to have been your style uh, as a player and that, you know, you want that. One of the things that I've noticed, and Saul, maybe you can address this, is it's really hard for coaches at the younger age levels to have role models that are not in a book. So I've read lots of books about coaching, as we all have, including yours, Saul, um, the, the one by Phil Jackson, 11 Rings. Or is it 41 rings? I don't know, whatever he's got, you know. Um, yeah, 41 rings. They, they, they're all fabulous. And, and, I, and I take pieces of them. The book about Scotty Bowman that Ken Dryden just wrote. Really interesting. But for, for coaches at the younger age levels or the younger levels of hockey, to have a role model that you can say, wow, I'm watching Sammy Joe Small there on the ice, running those, those exercises with those kids. I really like that approach. I've got to watch more of that. We don't have it. But there's no book that's been written about minor hockey coaches. I'm not talking about ones of one championships because I really could care less. But their approaches that they've used, whether with girls or boys, that have been successful. However you define success. I do have one thought on tentativeness. I don't know if it really addresses the issue, but it does say something maybe that does relate to the issue. And that is if boys get injured in sports, there's a kind of thing, nobody wants to see it, but there's a kind of thing with parents, well, uh, he's my kid, you know, and he was trying hard and he broke his leg or something. If a girl gets injured in sports, it's almost like, was well, something done irresponsibly here? So there's more of a protective um, reaction to females, young female athletes, young female getting hurt than there is with boys. Boys will be boys, they get hurt. So I, this is something, I mean, I perceived a long time ago and maybe that's why people are tentative, because there is a concern that, you know, girls have to be treated a little um, more carefully. I'd be trying to take that same approach. I think that I agree with Dr. Miller. I think at that point, though, you've got to be aware of, of the age. And so how you handle issues like accountability, um, I think has to be just very age appropriate. And really at that, at a younger age, it's bringing those traits as a coach, but um, really I, I think your number one goal, other than obviously keeping them safe, is um, it's just building that love of the game. And when they get up to the college level, um, you know, I would handle accountability a little bit differently. And, and um, you know, that, that, you know, if they're gonna be, in a high performance sport, then they're going to expect and, and get some high performance accountability at the same time. So the eggshell is a little thicker, maybe once they get a bit older, or you hope so. Um, <laughs> but it, in terms of um, in terms of in practice, I, I, I've dealt with this quite a bit. And, um, you know, I noticed when I first started, uh, I'd set up a small area game, kind of a one on one battle in the corner. And um, they were they were very, very, very tentative. And I struggled with that for years. And uh, finally, um, one year, um, this is the former lawyer and me coming out, um, before 
Uh, we even got on the ice. Um, I basically had them sign kind of a mock contract. And the way I described it was a, a permission to compete. Because what I felt that the the block was, and it gets back to what we were talking about earlier, is that um, they're really worried about what their, their teammates think about them. And so I had players uh, that were tentative and didn't want to battle another player because they were thinking that the other player would get mad at them, right? right. And so I had to I had to let them know that they have permission to compete because the only way that we're going to beat a physical team, you know, later on in the in the year is if we get better physically in practice. We can't just wait till a game and turn it on. And so we need to do this. So I had them agree first that that's something we needed to do. And then I had them agree that, hey, look at if, um, if Katrina goes into the corner and um, bumps Mary off the puck, it doesn't mean that Katrina is mad at Mary. Can we all agree on that? And then Mary, um, you know, if you fight back for the puck, it doesn't mean that, you know, you don't like Katrina. Can we all agree on that, right? And Honestly, since we've done that, um, I, I found that our right away our practices are more robust, more physical, um, and they, you know, once we got us sort of out in the open and talked about it, um, then we sort of eliminated that we're not going to affect our championship relationships by going after championship results, and uh, that made a huge, huge difference. Maybe it's maybe a good point for for me to retell my uh, you know the story most of you have heard me tell before about listening to Catriona Lemay Doan and Susan Ock talk um, at a lunchtime session at University of Calgary back in the late 90s when they started training together you know Susan moved from Winnipeg to train with Catriona two of the best speed skaters in the world at the time it took them a full year to get comfortable with and understanding that competing with each other in practice every single day was essential for them to get better. So, you know, it's kind of right along the lines that you were just uh, saying, Matt, um, I think a lot of female athletes maybe can grasp or understand the concept of beating an opponent in a game, but they maybe don't automatically grasp the fact that when Sammy and I go into the corner, I'm making her better by doing my best and she's making me better by doing her best. And like you very clearly and, and, and very well pointed out, like, can we all agree that that's a good thing? And when they understand that, like they have at it. And uh, I don't know if Ernst is still on, I didn't, didn't know, but we are extremely fortunate with the Danish team. We have none of that issue. We have a terrific group that compete like hell. And uh, like Thomas Pacina was literally blown away after the first game against the Czechs. Like we, we worked and competed so hard. And again, that's, that's in a game, but, but we do it at practice too. It's, it's really amazing. So we're, we're kind of blessed with the group we have, but so that, that understanding that it's about getting better and helping each other get better once once the girls at University of Vermont sort of understood that that's why I wanted them to compete at practice, then they were they were all in. So uh, Phil Jackson refers to partners in the dance and the whole mindset of sports making each other better uh, is, is to, to me the the essence of overcoming the fear of losing factor on the male side and possibly on the female side. If, if you have that Katrina Maidon and Susan Ock mentality of making each other better, you go to the Olympics and win a gold and silver. But if you don't, you won't be the best you can be. So Phil Jackson I think there's coaches out there that do have this mentality. So players, especially on the male side, aren't totally um, focused on winning and their egos are affected. And it, they, they just respect losing. And uh, in my mind, I celebrate losing. And that's not because I... I don't want to win. It's because I, I do. 
And I think the results coming from that performance impact will be far greater in the long run. Anything, comments on that, Saul? Well, I mean, if the commitment is to be the best you can be on an individual level, if the commitment is to be the best we can be on a team level, then whatever comes up, we've got to use it. So if we're successful, we use it to build our confidence, to build our sense of self. If we're not successful, we use it to improve our process. So if we have that mindset, we truly have the mindset to use it, then our, we're going to grow with our experience. If we don't use it, I always tell athletes, the, if we don't use it, the flip side is it can use you. And then it ends up being a negative kind of, yeah, finger pointing, self negative, self statements and so on. So it's always a matter of using it. You know, it's interesting, Morris, uh, in my golf book, Morris made a very insightful comment when he talked about making a bad shot and how you have to transform that negative. And he said, it's transforming irritation into inspiration. So if you can make losing an inspirational experience, if you lose and you see things that you have to work on to be better individually or collectively, then losing, I don't say it's okay, it's, but then you're, you know, at least you're, you're growing from the experience. And I think if the, the goal has to be always, I mean, at the elite level, the goal always has to be to be the best we can be. And, you know, as a coach, we want to inspire that in people. I mean, I work with people individually. I want to help them to reinforce that notion of being the best they can be. And if that's what they embrace, then okay, you have a good experience, or you lose a match, or you perform poorly, how can you use it to be better? And this is what I struggle with in minor hockey. Saul, there's sort of a competitive level, and then there's a house level. And it's sort of like, oh, just play for fun. Mm -hmm. And they lose out on the life skills, the ability to work together and work hard, put in the effort mm -hmm. to compete, because that's what life's all about. Mm -hmm. And so when, when do you um, begin to hold players at any age to a level of accountability in terms of listening, respecting an effort, whether it's house, elite, which leads to your Olympic players anyway at some point. Because well, right now that disconnect is hurting minor hockey. Okay? Well, it, it, it's interesting. If I speak to, like, you know, I'm often brought in to talk to a team and say a kid's team. And if I'm talking to a house team, it's much more difficult. If I'm talking to a more elite team, the kids are listening. They all want to be better. But sometimes in some of these other um, house leagues, the kids, they don't have the same drive to excel. I mean, maybe they, they want to have fun. Maybe, they, maybe there are kids in that group who do want to do well. But it's not the same collective drive to be the best we can be. It's harder, it's harder to work with a group like that. The kids do want to get better. They do want to get better, even at the host league level. When you have a coach, I've seen some host league coaches. So this now, go, now I'm digressing. Now, going to, to Saul's point just a few moments ago about at the house league level, at the lower levels, the younger age levels, I've seen some awfully good house league coaches who got those kids to a level of compete 
that I never thought possible. I remember one guy in Ottawa uh, was a terrific house league coach. He didn't want he, he his kids kids had been there. He wanted no part of anything higher, um, and they only practiced once a week. But he did the stuff with those kids that was unbelievable. So he made them better athletes, but he made them better people because they 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 learned to compete. They learned to be part of a team. They learned to to work with each other to to help each other. Um, and that was at a house league level, you know, okay. paying 600 bucks a year to be on the ice 50 times a year. You know, why are you, he wasn't pushing the kids. He was really working at drawing out. He, he used to take the kids to practices, have them line up along the glass and watch what was going on in practice and walk around to the kids. I saw him do this. And Brian would go to each kid and go, watch what that boy is doing in the corner to protect the puck. That's what we're going to try to do in our practices a little bit, even though their skill level was nowhere near what it was like. Wally, I, can I just jump in? I wanted to say something about, uh, I was interested about what Matt said about, you know, having the girls sign the competitive contract, which I thought was a great idea. And it just struck me that, and I don't know how it is in the rest of the country or the rest of the world, but here in Ontario, no one has real tryouts anymore. And all the players are selected for their mm-hmm. teams in November, December, January. And so no one is actually competing for a spot. You're not actually beating that girl to that puck in order to win your spot on the team. They're not having that opportunity at young ages. Now, I'm uh, guilty as charged that I pick my team before I ever have a tryout where you put player versus player. But I think it's it just struck me that for the level I'm coaching, perhaps when the girls go to a Team Ontario tryout, or they step on the ice with Matt, that might actually be the first time they're competing with their teammate for a spot on the team or competing against someone else for a spot on the team. And I think, you know, if that's the point where we're all of a sudden going to have these athletes deal with that type of challenge and adversity for the first time, I think we've really missed the boat. Now, you know, unfortunately, it takes quite the contract between all, you know, teams and associations to say, let's all do tryouts in the fall. Uh, and it, we're not there in Ontario, uh, but it, you know, I, I had to try out for every team I ever played for. <laughs> and I was usually one of the stronger players on the team. And I was scared every single tryout that I wasn't going to make it. And then I had to prove myself. And I don't think any of the players I've coached for the last five years have actually had to do that because we picked them for the team before they even show up at tryouts. So I think it's interesting. Are, are we really... Um, preparing our athletes for that type of challenge and adversity. And if they're not facing it until they're 18 years old, I think we've done them a disservice. 